Go ahead. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to invite you to uh, this edition of our TSIPG seminar and webinar series uh, for a resilient power grid. Um, we're really pleased to have one of our own uh, from TSIPG, Anna Scaglioni, here to present today. And I'll get to that in a minute. I also want to say thank you to all of you that have signed up and will be coming to our TSIPG industry government workshop next week. Uh, we have, I believe, over 175 people registered, which is really fantastic. So barring a hurricane like Hurricane Sandy, which we had last year, we're, we're getting ready for a, a really wonderful event. Um, so if you signed up for that, we'll see you in person next week. If you haven't signed up for that and you really want to come, let us know and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, it's my uh, really distinct pleasure to introduce someone I've known for many years now. In fact, we've worked together on TSIP or TSIPG projects uh, for about eight years uh, now. Uh, this is our own Professor Anna Scaglioni. Anna, when we started the project, was a professor at Cornell University. She was both an assistant and associate professor at Cornell University. And now she's a full professor uh, at the University of California, Davis. Um, she's a key contributor, and in fact, she's a person by training who's a computer network person, but has really embraced the power side and, and become one of those people that really understands uh, both sides of, 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 of the equation now to make things happen. She has a long list of awards, which you've all seen on what's been mailed out. Uh, but rather than reading all of those, I, I, I think we just have to say we're really glad to have her part of the TSIPG team, and we're really glad to have her here to present today. This is work, as you can see, that she's done uh, with her former postdoc, post Zifeng Wang, who was part of the TSIPG project as well, and of course, uh, Bob, uh, Professor Bob Thomas, who's now retired from Cornell, but also uh, in the past has been part of the project. So thank you very much, Anna, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, uh, and thank you for inviting me. It's nice. Uh, as Bill said, I'm part of the family. And this is, was the, sort of the very first line of work uh, that I did with Bob Thomas. So this is a line of work that is dear to my heart. Um, and uh, G. Fang was really instrumental uh, to get this work started. So. What is complex networks? What is the motivation for looking at complex networks theories um, and uh, utilize those tools to understand how the power grids work? Well, power grids have uh, a lot of the features that typically are analyzed through or as complex networks through the theories that are used for complex networks because they're systems that did grow organically over the past century. And these uh, introduced some randomness in the way they were developed. Uh, and uh, um, they have grown to balance a lot of economic objectives, benefits uh, of savings, but also security. Um, and so all of this uh, makes uh, these, these uh, systems very interesting. Uh, and uh, the features that they have um, are very interesting. Um, but um, interestingly, uh, uh, the design and analysis of power grids uh, has not tried to take sort of this approach that uh, is oftentimes taken in looking at phenomena of this magnitude, um, of just sort of lifting up and looking at from the, a 10 story building, how does this look? Um, in fact, most of the design and analysis of power grids has been through test cases. Um, uh, and so there is no sort of general uh, model for how grids look like, uh, what are their components as, a, as an ensemble. And so one of the first efforts and first questions that I asked when I was talking to Bob Thomas about the grid is, could we characterize the properties of this system uh, as an ensemble? And maybe we can derive some useful insights on how they behave. And so what does it mean to look at it as a complex system? So, Typically, when we analyze complex systems, we have to analyze all its parts. But normally, the way you start is by analyzing how these systems are coupled. Uh, and so this is a system of systems, but the coupling among these different parts is definitely through the transmission lines. 
And so it is uh, not uh, unusual to identify complex system theories with analyzing graphs of some sort. And obviously in power systems we do have a graph, which is the topology of, of the grid. Um, so as I said, power engineers tend to grasp trends by analyzing uh, very thoroughly uh, their uh, theories through test cases. Uh, and there, are, there is a, 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 a shared um, set of test cases, uh, usually they are referred to the IEEE test uh, uh, systems that are utilized in papers to um, essentially uh, verify hypotheses. A certain scheme, control scheme is good or that a certain phenomenon may occur on the grid. Um, and there have been actually before uh, studies on models that try to capture macroscopic trends uh, that are uh, not necessarily tied to a test cases that sort of simplify or, or in some cases somewhat oversimplify the, 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 the topology. Uh, Thorpe in 2004 adopted the ring topology and a continuum model to try to see whether one could uh, uh, have a, a sort of deterministic uh, law for how flows uh, in the grid uh, were um, uh, affected uh, by, by different conditions. And Rosa Casals and Valverde and Soleil uh, adopted a tree topology uh, to study uh, the effect of breaking uh, lines over the grid. But the bias has been so far very much towards deterministic models. Um, another thing that, that prompted a lot, of the, the, uh, um, a lot of attention on the marriage between complex systems and um, the uh, analysis of power systems was the work by uh, Carreras, Neumann, Dobson, Lynch, and a number of other co-authors that I uh, that I'm not mentioning. So starting around 2002, uh, they uh, tried to create um, um, a set of, uh, of models uh, to reproduce uh, something that was observed in data uh, available about the um, uh, size of outages in the grid. And what they discovered is what, what, what is called a self-critical behavior, a behavior that you find in a pile of sand when you, when you uh, subject this pile of sand to, uh, to forces that tend to, to make it fall apart. So what you see is that you have in this, uh, the, 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 the size of the avalanche uh, tends to have a heavy tail type of distribution. So you have uh, with uh, a, a power law, a probability of having an avalanche uh, of bigger size that declines relatively slowly with the size of the avalanche. And so this self-criticality is one of the classical uh, uh, keywords that ap appear in complex system theory. Uh, and one of the interesting aspects is that these are observed through real data, um, but they also were observed through these deterministic kind of modeling uh, by testing different test networks. So somehow this trend uh, can be reproduced even if you change from the IEEE 300 bus system to another uh, equally sized bus system. Um, and so the question, is, the question is, is natural. Why do we have the same cascading trends uh, changing grids? Uh, is there anything intrinsic in the grid itself that, that creates this phenomena? Um, so as a result perhaps of, of this analysis and the fact that uh, uh, the scaling behavior call for the attention of, uh, um, of people that study complex system. Uh, so there, there, is a, there, there, there has been a number of papers that try, has tried to apply uh, the, the general um, theoretical framework of complex system to the grid. Um, so what are, what are the people that, who are the people that typically study complex systems. So in a way, it's a branch of statistical physics. Um, but the interesting is that uh, the tools that were once used to understand uh, how interactive particles uh, 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 result in a certain emergent behavior are now mostly applied to macroscopic system. And one typical example is social network. Uh, so the way the, the, this uh, theoretical study goes is pretty much as follows. Um, you have a macroscopic phenomenon, 
Uh, and this happens in a system that is complex in the sense it's a system of systems. So you try to characterize what couples the different subsystems and then try to develop a theory that over this specific scaffold analyzes different random processes that take place. Um, and so this is in a nutshell what most of the papers that fall in this general area uh, discuss. Uh, and so not surprisingly, the way you start is precisely by understanding how, what are the features of this scaffold, because most of the random processes that you are analyzing, they are constrained uh, to operate through those scaffold of interactions. Um, and so uh, one of the uh, main uh, results of this theory is, you know, it's, there are a lot of elegant theories about random graphs, not surprisingly. Um, and there are a lot of interesting results that have to do with, uh, with the, how these random graphs behave microscopically. Um, the simplest choice of a random graph is called the Erdos-Reni graph. Uh, it's a graph that has n nodes, uh, and the typical model uh, has a certain probability p uh, of generating an edge between two nodes um, uh, that are a part of this set of vertices. Um, and um, the other uh, popular model is the random geometric graph um, that is instead characterized by a radius parameter. So in this case, you deploy points in a d-dimensional space, and if they fall within a certain radius, within a certain distance, they are connected. So these are two simple statistical models that uh, are utilized in, um, in, in these theories. And an example of emergent behavior that many uh, authors uh, have studied is the, the so-called phase transition towards connectivity, right? What, what probability P or what radius R will make the, uh, this graph connected almost surely, right? So now, obviously, these are very simple model. All the statistics of this can be derived, and then a lot of other interesting questions can be answered. But unfortunately, many real graphs, including the power network, don't obey uh, these, uh, these simple models. And, and you can actually realize that by deriving what will be the emergent features of this graph, so, such as, for example, the degree distribution. Right, so if you have a graph like the Erdos-Reding graph, the degree distribution is binomial. So you will see something that looks a little bit like a Gaussian distribution. Um, but many graphs in reality do not have this uh, distribution. And in fact, a lot of graphs have either geometric distribution or heavy tail distributions. Other features that are examined very much, uh, especially because complex networks try to study uh, oftentimes social phenomena is how nodes are clustered, if there are a lot of nodes that share common neighbors. And as I said, erdos reni graph and random geometric graphs, they actually do not exhibit some of the dominant uh, features of many real-time graphs. So, so what has happened uh, over uh, the last decade is that you know, in the, in the field of statistical physics, people have come up with other models. Um, and uh, oftentimes, these models are uh, generative models. So you just uh, in, insert in this model some law that makes the graph grow in a certain organic fashion. Uh, one very popular one is the Barabasi-Albert model that uh, apparently matches very well the distribution of links between web pages or co-authors. Um, those, those particular graphs exhibit a power law in the degree, and the, gener the growth model stipulates that a vertex has um, a higher probability of being chosen uh, uh, if it has more incoming links. And so this is, uh, uh, this is a growth uh, mechanism that is called preferential attachment. Um, and what really made people uh, spark even further interest in the power grid, aside from the, the work of Dobson and uh, Newton and co-authors on the uh, self-critical behavior, has been, sorry, the, the work by Watson Strogatz, published on Nature in 1998, um, where they, they suggested another form uh, of uh, random graph model that is sort of trying to uh, uh, sit in between a perfectly regular and locally connected graph that you see there on the left of the slide, and instead the erdos reni graph that I mentioned before, which has a totally random pattern. Um, and so what Watson Strogas came up is this simple model where they say you start from a regular graph which is locally connected, and you just pick and choose a few 
uh, of uh, the nodes and edges and rewire them uh, uh, randomly uh, to any edge. And they, they actually were able to, to show that a, a lot of the features of this um, of this graph uh, that is sort of in the middle between this totally random and this completely uh, 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 locally connected and deterministically connected graph, a lot of the features of this graph actually are similar to the, the uh, several networks that you find between uh, social phenomena um, uh, and uh, also technological networks that are built through technology. Um, and uh, in particular, what they did uh, in analyzing this, uh, even though you know, they, they, they really didn't claim that this was a perfect fit, they just allowed you to eyeball how much better the small world type of graph uh, uh, reproduce features that you could even see visually uh, uh, present in a graph like the pa a power grid graph. Um, so what, what this, uh, this particular plot is, is a circular embedding of a graph all the nodes are at the edges of this circle, and the edges are represented by these lines. And if, if you generate a random Erdos-Renyi graph so that you match the average uh, degree of this uh, sample uh, of the power network, uh, then you see something very peculiar, that you see that there are a lot of links that jump across completely randomly. Uh, While well, you can see that the small world graph has only a few of these uh, this link, as we explained before, and the power network seems to very much uh, uh, um, reproduce that kind of behavior. So watson Strogas came up with this conjecture that perhaps uh, small world models um, were fitting also the power grid um, and were perhaps you know, the result of some tension between keeping things organized and local and some randomness, some opportunity that, that made other wires appear. Um, so, as I said, uh, cascading failure models that exhibited some interesting power law. The fact that Small and Strogatz model uh, sort of suggested perhaps that that could be a good fit with power nets, so sparked even more interest in applying this type of point of view to the power grid. And so there were, there were these work by uh, Newman, by uh, Whitney and others, by Albert and others, and Rosas Casals. Uh, that focus on different aspects of the power grid, either topological studies or they focus on the degree distribution and try to, to uh, um, uh, infer insights um, from these, uh, these, type of, um, uh, these type of studies. Uh, and the, 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 the idea that uh, you know, the small world model uh, was actually a good model uh, came up just not only uh, eyeballing this these graphs, but also quantitatively utilizing these, uh, um, this particular measure, which is called um, uh, the clustering coefficient. In, a sen in essence, it measures how many uh, uh, neighbors are shared among two nodes that have an edge. Um, and you can see that the clustering coefficient for a small world graph, uh, and um, uh, it, it, sorry, uh, they, they actually have shown that, uh, how you could calculate this clustering coefficient for a small world graph. And for the power grid, these are all different test cases. Uh, the IEEE 30, uh, 57, 118, these are growing sizes uh, for these uh, test cases. And you can see that the clustering coefficient is fairly high, uh, as opposed to a, an Erdos-Rendi graph here uh, that has you know, so almost um, one-tenth of the clustering coefficient for a given average degree. Um, so so this, is, uh, this was the insight. So one question that we, 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 we were wondering about with Bob and, and Jifang is, um, can this approach provide insights? And actually, a lot of people also asked us this question more from the power side. Uh, can we actually utilize these models for uh, gaining insight on any of the behavior that we care about in the grid? Uh, one of the, the issues of just being a little bit too literal about applying these theories to power grids is that there is actually a very peculiar way the, 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 the connectivity of that graph affects 
um, power flow, economic flows, and all the other phenomena that happen on the grid. And therefore, uh, a lot of, if you are too uh, literal in translating some of the theories to the power grid, then the criticism is that these results are not really related with the physical laws that govern the grid. Remember, I said you study the scaffold, and then you, you uh, stipulate that there is some random process that works on the scaffold. But if that random process is not a physical uh, reproduction of the laws that occupy, that take place in the power grid, then uh, this will not be giving you very good insight. So, so let me first analyze this conjecture. This is really the first work that we did. We, we uh, took several test cases of different sizes, and we looked at the statistics of the grid um, uh, and discovered actually some discrepancies and some interesting things that were not um, uh, noticed before. And then by analyzing this object, trying to uh, um, combine it together with the laws, we, we gained some insights, but not the ultimate insights. So I'll, my, my talk will conclude with somehow a challenge or a question on how to, to move further. So what we model are the topological and electrical characteristics of the grid. Something that most of the other authors had ignored is that you, know, you have a weight, you have an admittance in each of these lines, so that also uh, is a, a relevant parameter to look at. Um, and uh, so we also look at scaling trends, so how, the, the, how does the grid grow? So if you take a, a 30 bus system versus a 3,000 bus system, uh, how do the statistics change? Is there any uh, you know, uh, scaling that occurs, like at every resolution it appears that the statistics are the same, or uh, do the statistics eventually change as you grow the system in size? And, and then basically what we did is relate these statistics to the properties of uh, the grid admit admittance matrix. So let me be specific. In the grid there are three sections, high, medium, and low voltage. Most of the test cases uh, that are available are uh, um, about the transmission network. We actually have one uh, data sample uh, that if I have time I'll briefly discuss uh, about the medium voltage network. The distribution network uh, has been considered for many years somewhat uninteresting is radial, and, and so I won't talk about that. Um, so uh, let's, let's get to the point. So what is the relationship between the scaffolding, the wiring, and uh, the quantity that is actually relevant to, uh, um, to understand what flows in the grid. And this, is, this will be very boring for, uh, for any power engineer, but for anyone that has a different background, will not. Um, so you have an adjacency matrix for a graph, uh, and uh, each of these edges is essentially a transmission line that connects uh, different points in the network. These points can be uh, um, points where you uh, draw power because it's a substation that draws power for an entire community, or it's a generating facility, or these are intermediate interconnecting buses. Uh, and if you want to get these, uh, the, 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 the key parameter here, the key uh, um, uh, way the graph gets into the uh, uh, laws of physics for the grid is through these admittance metrics, which you can generate by weighting each of the edges with the appropriate uh, weight, which is the, admit, the uh, uh, edge admittance. And so after that, what you want is essentially to express in a compact fashion uh, Kirchhoff uh, uh, current and voltage laws and Ohm's law. And uh, the way you do it is to the so-called power flow equation. This tells you what is the power at a certain bus. It's, it's a power phasor. Um, uh, by simply multiplying the voltage phasor times the uh, conjugate of the current phasor, phasor. And you can obviously use Ohm's law to get rid of the current because it's not an independent variable. And so the current is going to be the sum of the currents that, that comes at the bus. Uh, and so it's given by essentially taking the weights in the admittance matrix and multiplying it by the voltages and adding all these up. So you have these uh, equations, which are called the power flow equation. Uh, and the characteristics of the topology enter in, in, in this law exactly through this matrix. So what are the random grid characteristics? Uh, the first studies that appeared uh, were focused on the, um, the grid distribution of this graph. 
and uh, uh, it was stipulated by these authors that the, uh, based on the data that they had available that the geometric uh, probability density function was, uh, a probability distribution function was a good fit for the degree distribution. Um, so we, we kind of uh, looked at that a little bit uh, um, uh, further uh, and the idea was to instead of looking at the uh, uh, fitting the, the histogram uh, of the data uh, through a, a non-distribution, we decided to actually look at the probability generating function and we uh, kept an open mind and said this perhaps is not exactly a geometric distribution, it could be a mixture distribution. And so for a mixture model, what you will see is that the generating function is the product uh, of a lot of um, uh, kernels, each associated with this different statistical behavior of trying to mix in. Um, so uh, this was actually a good insight because the degree distribution re resulted in fact in a mixture uh, of distribution which has um, one distribution with a constant support plus uh, a, a geometric term. And how does that work? Well, the, 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 uh, probability, uh, the, the probability generating function is simply uh, uh, this uh, simple polynomial in Z whose coefficients are the probabilities of a certain degree uh, for a certain node. Uh, and the interesting part is that if you have a geometric distribution, now obviously the geometric distribution lasts uh, up to infinity, but you cannot have an infinite degree, so you have to truncate it. Um, so this polynomial will have in that case a very specific structure. It will have this simple rational structure. So what you have to do if you plot this uh, polynomial with respect to Z in the Z plane, in a complex plane, you will see that uh, you will have a lot of zeros of this polynomial that fall in a circle. <laughs> and the radius of this circle depends on, on your probability. So if that's all you see, then you will have a perfect truncated geometric distribution. If you see other zeros falling here and there, then there is something else. Uh, and that's precisely what we saw. Uh, you calculate the geometric, uh, the, the generating functions for um, uh, all buses, or you separate generator buses, load buses, and connection buses in these other plots, and you not only see the circle that I mentioned about, all these zeros that belong to the geometric component, but you see other components here, and those are indicative of a more complicated structure that includes uh, some other uh, aspect. And so you can see that, that our, uh, our reconstructed distribution fit quite well with the samples. Um, now, these are sample networks. I cannot guarantee that there hasn't been any reduction in these sample networks. So there are some unusually large uh, degrees, like uh, 25 or 30 buses emerging out of that. And those are outliers. Uh, however, uh, I think the trend can be captured pretty well. And so these are some of the parameters that we were able to get for the bigger uh, grid samples that we had, the NISO system and the uh, Western Interconnect. Um, and, um, and this is the, the, the type of uh, mixture distribution that you get for this. Um, so now that we had a good sense of what was the degree distribution, the other interesting thing is that we noticed that across these different samples, if you're scaling from, from the, 30, uh, uh, the 30 bus system up to 3,000 buses, the degree on average was roughly the same. Really what changed uh, the degree was the location, right? The NISO case has a higher average degree than the Western Interconnect, but you didn't see that changing the size of the grid made a big difference in terms of changing the degree distribution. And this actually was interesting because this went back to, 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 to sort of deny the conjecture that this could possibly be small world networks uh, because small world networks have to have a growing degree with size. If they don't have a growing degree with size, they eventually will be disconnected. Um, well, power grids don't have that phenomenon and nevertheless they are not disconnected. That's pretty much uh, an axiom. And so this is uh, an interesting outcome of this analysis. It cannot quite be a small world network just because of the degree distribution. That, that, that conjecture doesn't hold uh, if, you, um, if you scale it up too much. Uh, and so in particular, 
uh, we cannot observe that the expected degree grows like in, a, in the order of the logarithm of the number of buses, and, and therefore um, uh, that's that's a the, that's a problem with that conjecture. Um, um, and uh, the average shortest path also uh, uh, grows logarithmically. Um, and so that's actually very interesting from the point of view of cyber physical system overlaid over the grid. There is a lot of concern about how, you know, how much would be the delay accumulated over uh, the network, right? And uh, a lot of the transmission lines are a natural layout also for the communication lines. Uh, that, that need to serve a, a lot of objectives, not just getting the data uh, far out for, uh, for uh, processing at the control center, but also to, to uh, enforce local protection scheme or other things that are more local. And so even if the communication network uh, reflected the same characteristics of the topology of the grid, we wouldn't be uh, in, in such bad shape, actually. The, the, average, short, the average length of these paths uh, grows uh, only logarithmically in the number of nodes. The other quantity that we looked at um, is a, a, a little bit more mysterious. It has to do with the second small, it, it is the second smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian of this graph. The Laplacian is essentially the, the same as the admittance matrix except all the weights are one, right? So it's like as if every, every line had admittance one. Um, and this quantity is very important in graph theory because it indicates how close is the grid from being disconnected, how densely connected is the grid. And in a minute I will tell you more about the meaning of this particular parameter. But the thing that was interesting for us is to discover that uh, even though these, the grid uh, samples that we had clearly had a very uh, small algebraic connectivity. The algebraic connectivity was decreasing in the order of one over n, roughly. Um, it is something that you will find, it's a, it's a trend that you will find be, uh, uh, to lie in between uh, two kinds of uh, extreme, uh, which is here, these are uh, the algebraic connectivities of regular graphs. Uh, by regular, I mean uh, they have a perfect pattern of interconnection. They have the same degree. Uh, and this is uh, just essentially one dimensional. So it's, you can imagine it's like a cycle, it's like a necklace. And this is instead 2D, it's like a fabric. And uh, power grids are somewhat in between these two trends. So what is the significance of algebraic connectivity? This is very much used as a parameter when you impose uh, uh, some kind of um, model uh, of a random process that uh, utilizes uh, uh, the, the, the graph as the scaffold uh, for, for the random process. In particular, uh, what this uh, parameter uh, indicates, if it is greater than zero, it indicates you know, the graph is connected, which is good news. Uh, but it also, it's the rate at which if you had used this Laplacian matrix as a transition probability, is the rate at which you will converge towards a uniform stationary distribution. Uh, or if you are not a, a statistics geek, uh, another way of understanding is relating this Laplacian operator with the um, Laplace Beltrami operator in continuous uh, space. And this operator essentially governs heat diffusion. So is how fast you're gonna reach the same temperature. Um, so it's a fast effectively diffusion happens on the grid. And it's sort of interesting to notice that the grid is not so fast at mixing, but it's not quite as bad as being, as I said, a necklace. It's almost in between. Um, so we, we said it couldn't possibly be a, a small world network. But what, what we saw is that up until a certain size, if you are in the hundreds of buses, the small world network exhibited a lot of the features that our sample test had. Um, and what we notice is that the algebraic connectivity was easily reproduced if instead of insisting on the small world network for big, bigger sizes, we actually connected a lot of subnetworks in a regular pattern. We just actually added uh, uh, to certain random, uh, randomly selected point perfectly uh, um, uh, symmetric uh, connections that connect all these subnetworks. So again, this is a, a one-dimensional 
a graph, but each of the nodes is now itself is a subnetwork. Um, and so these are the type of uh, 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 connectivities that we see. The other aspect that we thought could help uh, getting uh, better uh, patterns was instead of rewiring completely arbitrary, arbitrarily in the uh, small world network topology, we, um, we analyze how the nodes are chosen for rewiring in the actual test, and we notice that they tend to be correlated, they tend to be clustered. And that's also uh, intuitive um, because you know, power lines are costly to deploy and perhaps they disconnect physical uh, sub-regions uh, and they tend to be uh, uh, connecting the same portions of the grid. So this is sort of reflecting this type of structure that I mentioned before where you have these sub-networks that behave like uh, pretty much like small world network and then you have these long holes that connect all these subsystems. And uh, last but not least, the other important para characteristic of the uh, admittance is the line impedance. So what is the distribution of the impedance? So we said that the degree do not obey a power law. They are actually roughly a geometric distribution. Um, but the, um, uh, the impedance actually exhibits a clear power law. So these are the samples of uh, the, the essentially the resistance uh, um, the, actually, sorry, the, the susceptance of the, uh, of the uh, line, which is roughly X, right? Um, which is dominating over R. Um, and so we, uh, we found that, you know, you, you have to find a, a good heavy tail distribution to match this grid. There are a lot of different heavy tail distribution. The best match, the best fit was with this particular distribution. It's called double Pareto log normal. Uh, these are interesting distribution, but the, the main uh, advantage of this was the fit. And you can actually see here, perhaps this table is a little tiny, but uh, that you can actually find uh, parameters also for fitting with the, with the log normal distribution, which is slightly simpler, right? slightly simpler in, in terms of structure. But these are the typical candidates. And essentially, we, we did like, well, we tried them all, and we found the ones that was fi fitting best. Um, and then at this point, when, when you have this data, uh, um, um, you, um, you actually don't often have an embedding. You don't know how spatially they are distributed, right? Um, in some cases you do, but in most cases you don't. You just have a topology and the people represent it in a nice graph, but you don't know that they are located at that physical distance. Um, so the conjecture was for us that, you know, the largest impedances were uh, associated with these lattice connections that were connecting subgrids, um, because it was reasonable that the largest impedance, the largest impedances were associated with longest distances, and logically uh, that seems to be um, a, a, it seems to be a reasonable con conjecture that these subnetworks that are more random are more local, while these wires are the the ones that are further away, and therefore they sort of populate. Uh, the tail of this distribution. Now, this is pure conjecture. Again, we don't have uh, uh, physical data uh, for the location, so we cannot confirm that the actual uh, the attribution of the impedance to these long rewired lines is, is correct. Uh, medium uh, voltage networks uh, share some of the characteristics uh, of the uh, um, transmission networks. However, you know, as expected, there is nothing particularly surprising in this result. They are much less of a mesh. They tend to be uh, uh, more uh, radial-like, even though this case actually has fairly uh, good um, complexity in that sense. So you see that there are several loops. Uh, but the algebraic connectivity is much lower, the clustering coefficient is much lower, so all of these characteristics uh, uh, gradually change. And the distribution network, most people expect it to be pretty radial, pretty much like a tree. So now I, I've t told you that, you know, in, in some cases uh, the literature had, uh, you know, had good insights but not found good uh, exact models uh, for the grid, now we have a good model, so what, what can we do with it? Um, so the first thing that, that one can uh, naturally do just with the degree distribution is to figure out, uh, without doing a lot of uh, effort, 
um, what would be uh, the random pattern, what would be the frequency at which if I pick and destroy lines, I will break it apart. apart. And for that, you just need topology and degree distribution. You don't need anything else. Um, in fact, um, this was established by an early result by Cohen, Heretz, um, and then co-authors in 2000. And they were actually thinking about breaking down the internet, like what will it take to break down the internet? Uh, but this applies actually to, to any general graph. Uh, and what they came out is, is this interesting uh, concept and idea and, and basically uh, rule that if, you're, um, if you take an edge and you look at the average degree of that edge, and if you see that the average degree of that edge is two, then you are in some kind of critical phase transition for the graph. The graph, it's very vulnerable. It's on the edge of being essentially broken apart. Um, and the, the, through some mathematical manipulation, they proved that you can uh, uh, rewrite this condition by just taking the ratio between the second order and first order moment of the degree distribution. If you say that, see that that is two, then your network is at a critical phase transition. So all you have to do is to figure out what rate, F, random rate, what probability you need to bring this parameter up to two, starting from a certain degree distribution that gives you some parameter k0. So they, they found that you could actually relate these two uh, uh, quantities this way. So you just match uh, this k parameter to two, and you get this nice relationship that says that the frequency at which you need to remove at random uh, lines um, is equal to 1 minus 1 over this ratio minus 1. Uh, and so obviously the, the phase transition, you can see that when, uh, when uh, um, I subtract here 1, uh, then this becomes 0. So then at that point, I'm already at the phase transition. But anything greater than that uh, keeps me uh, um, uh, with the, uh, the, the greater is this, the, the, the smaller is essentially, uh, the, the higher is the probability that I need uh, uh, to, to be able to have to demove um, to break apart the grid. And so what Rosa Casals uh, and co-authors uh, did in 2007, they said, well, if a power grid, uh, I apologize for this uh, error here, uh, the power grid has a geometric distribution. So let me see if instead of picking at random these edges, I pick uh, them selectively. I start from the node that has the highest number of uh, edges, and then I go down the list and uh, uh, um, pick them. Uh, I still flip a coin uh, in order to decide whether destroying them or not, but I start with the nodes in a certain ordering. So he, they were able actually to relate the random rate at which you, uh, you need to break any arbitrary randomly chosen edge with this selective rate uh, as follows for uh, a, a particular, um, for the particular case of the geometric distribution in the degree. And so with that, they were part in, in, capable of choosing um, the particular uh, rate of selective uh, removal that would uh, break down the power grid. Um, and there were other results that followed, uh, including a, a paper by Wang and Rong in 2009 um, that uh, applied a slightly different theory and that got a lot of press. Because I think uh, the paper from, from Chinese authors and people were terrified that uh, there was a plan to attack the Western Interconnect uh, as a result of that. Uh, but in, in fact, it was sort of uh, dwelling on, uh, on similar theories. So now what we, what we use is, now that we, we knew that the geometric distribution was not a perfect fit for the degree, we, we slightly corrected the result uh, of these previous authors. We showed that actually, for the true distribution, what you need is to renormalize the equation that they had with an appropriate parameter which depends on the a particular grid you have on the statistics of the grid. So if you have a test grid, you, you have to update it based on the true uh, degree distribution of your grid. Uh, and by doing that, you can actually have a very good uh, guess, uh, educated guess on how, what is the correct rate to break apart the grid. In fact, you will get the red line if you apply Soles uh, um, theory, while uh, for uh, uh, for our uh, renormalized law, 
you get these other lines. This is for the random, the random uh, selection that the theory holds, uh, appears to hold uh, for the power grid. And uh, for the uh, selective uh, removal, uh, our uh, laws are, are pretty close to, to, to what you get uh, from uh, numerical simulations. Okay, but you know, there is this one thing. So the, the frequency at which you pick nodes, you pick edges at random to destroy, that's not exactly how cascading failures work, right? You don't pick things at random. You, one, the first one could be random, but then the fact that you have changed the topology of the grid redistributes the flaws, and that changes the probability that other lines are going to be uh, um, uh, targeted for removal, right? And that, that happens due to the power flow equations. So um, the unfortunate thing is that this is where sort of these uh, complex network theory kind of reached a, a, a wall, right? Because this idea of thinking of cascading failures, something purely random, right? Or ignoring the power flows and just looking at the topology didn't really carry over. And so there were a number of papers that suggested that the flow redistribution went, went through some kind of random process of redistribution through near neighbors. Um, and we can kind of look at several samples. These are perhaps not the most compelling, but uh, what we did is essentially we removed arbitrary lines at random and see how the power flow redistributed and what lines were at the risk of being congested and therefore had much higher probability of being um, removed. And there is nothing that suggests that the, this redistribution concentrate power along shortest paths or near neighbors. It actually, it's all over the map. So, uh, and that's, the, the reason is that, you know, you can argue the Kirchhoff law looks a lot like sort of redistribution of flows um, in, um, you know, in the, on the street cars redistribute through near neighbors. But uh, the ohm voltage, the ohm law and the voltage law are very different. And so they actually spread in a, in a, in a pattern which can only be explained through the power flow equation, not with other um, simple random processes um, uh, through the network. And so therefore that's where sort of the insights from taking this simple, completely uh, detached uh, from the power flow equation approach and looking at the network didn't work. So, so this leaves us still to mostly cascading failure models that are numerical. And I dubbed into this uh, witchcraft too, <laughs> right? I also have uh, my own version of these numerical models where you essentially what you do is you track how the uh, underlying uh, admittance matrix is modified and you recalculate how the power flow um, would make lines more at risk of tripping because they are congested or not. But that's a numerical process. There is no simple uh, random process that, that can capture that without going through these equations. That's, that's the key result. And so the way things are done are roughly in this way. You take a specific operating point, you fail a line, you recalculate the new connectivity, and you calculate the new flows. And there are efficient ways of doing this. Uh, uh, there is uh, the so-called line average distribution factor that allows you to, see, to very easily numerically recalculate where the flows are going to be, uh, um, how the flows are going to be altered. But there are other aspects you can actually take into account. Uh, failure, particular failure models, for example, we took into account um, the, the, the uh, digital relays that take a certain amount of time to trip the line, um, or the optimum re generation redispatch. There is a model called OPA that Dobson and co-authors utilize uh, to recalculate uh, the power generation dispatch after a violation, after a tripping uh, event. Um, and then all the lines that violate a certain criterion are tripped, and then you start again. Um, so the, the objection to these models is that still they're really qu qu quite primitive, in, even though they include all these seven steps. Uh, one is that they don't average over load conditions. They typically start from a certain operating condition. And the other one is that they don't consider dynamics. Um, so let me very quickly, how much 
time do I have? Three, four minutes. So, um, so there are some insights that though we gained, and it was by just by, again, looking at this matrix a little bit uh, more closely, and simplifying the AC power flow model into the so-called DC power flow model. So we uh, say that the, the voltage amplitude is one, uh, the, the angle difference is small enough that uh, you, know, you can approximate essentially the power flow equation that I had in the previous slide with these uh, linear equations. And the phase angle now are the, uh, the proxy for the state. And so the characteristics actually of these, uh, this acceptance matrix um, are very similar to the, those of the, um, the admittance matrix. So it's a sort of a, a also itself a Laplacian has the same sparsity and the weights scale roughly the same. And really, thank you, that was my. And so really what you see is that what, what, if you know that this matrix has a certain structure, what that is telling you is that the balancing between power generation and power load, I mean this is the, you can split the power vector in two parts, this balance is, has to occur of a certain sus subspace, right? So if you know certain properties, certain mathematical properties of this matrix B, it has certain sparsity, it has certain spectral property, you sort of know where these two, uh, um, the difference between these two vectors, you actually know where the difference between these two vectors lies, and so you can make educated guesses about the behavior of these two. And one interesting aspect that we discovered is that if you actually don't do anything too complicated, you take uh, an eigenvalue decomposition of the, the matrix Y, you not only find that there are relatively few dominant eigenvalues in this decomposition, this is actually, these are all the eigenvalues uh, of the uh, NISO system, but you also find that the eigenvectors are very sparse. Uh, so there is a lot of structure, so this subspace has, is kind of skewed along certain dimensions and it tends to only uh, include a very limited group of these. Um, um, so overall what you can guess is actually that, you know, the, the dispatch for minimum cost will actually tend to line up with this principal eigenvalue. So we'll tend to put a lot of strong components in certain lines uh, and those may be the most congested lines. Uh, and that though, however, that de does depend on the load condition because it depends on how much this load condition brings you to select certain dominant uh, dimensions in this space. Uh, the other interesting aspect is uh, from, from the data perspective is that we see that the state is highly compressible also spatially and that you don't need a lot of uh, mm, a lot of complicated, uh, you don't need to actually record uh, all the dimensions of the state. You can actually project it on, the, uh, on some of these eigen components and compress it. Um, but the other interesting aspect is that if you just use this sparsity and these dominant eigenvectors, you know, the entries that are highest, this is actually one of the metrics that they, is called centrality in these um, uh, graph theoretic studies. Um, and it has an interesting uh, uh, effect uh, on measurement systems that we actually didn't expect. Uh, if you, for example, place the PMUs in the largest entries of this vector, uh, we find that uh, you're, and, and you try to estimate the state both from power injections from the SCADA system and PMUs, we find that the Newton algorithm works much better <laughs> for some reason. So it actually has the ability of stabilizing these, uh, these algorithms because these are really significant uh, components for the system. So this is essentially wrapping up. The grid uh, does not represent a scaffold where you can just look at near neighbor random interaction and figure out how flows are going to be redistributed. So complex system theory needs to be expanded really to capture uh, uh, the grid and the phenomena that occur on the grid. Um, so we are still stuck with numerical models uh, and in, in trying to attempt to expand this theory, perhaps uh, we should try to include dynamics on this side and temporal uh, randomness on this other side. Um, uh, but there are some interesting macroscopic phenomena that you can kind of guess or have insights about if you look at these models. 
Um, and um, I think uh, the, the, the analysis of the grid is, is not complete without uh, analyzing the operating points, but still it does give you some insights on um, um, a lot of aspects, including how to design essentially efficient measurement systems uh, on this grid. And with this, I conclude. Thank you. I will start, and we'll okay. see we'll see who else comes. I think you summed it up. I mean, if you go back one slide, I think you summed it up. I mean, this is sort of what I was thinking all along. It's, I mean, I, I really like sort of the way in which you develop this theory, but at the end of the day, the challenge is how do we sort of take this numerical solution and combine it with the graph theoretic solution in a way that Hopefully it's combined in a structural way rather than a way that it all has to be solved in one piece. Is right. That, do I have sort of what the essential challenge is? Correct, absolutely. So, so, so to me, I, I think we are chickening out with the numerical models. Uh, it's the brute force way, right? It's very brute force. And instead, the, you know, you, you can see that there are all these trends. Yeah. You can tell that if you look at all these bus systems as they scale, certain things are maintained. Certain, even if you do the numerical, you just see that. Uh, so there has to be a way of looking at a complex system that has some intrinsic right. constraint of this form uh, and understanding things at a higher level. And I think there is some kind of, it's, it's a mathematical question that is beyond just statistics or inventing simple statistical Markov chain type of models. Right. But it's, it's still future work, right? We're, it is future work. I haven't solved it. It is up or grab. Any talented person has an interest in power and has, uh, is not afraid of mathematics and statistics, I think, is equipped to okay. solve this problem. Thank you. Or at least try. Uh, my question, uh, um, I want to get something like a takeaway. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's uh, in the conclusion. If you can put the slide for the conclusion. Uh, when you mean that the admittance matrix uh, of the power grid has, uh, uh, is following some clear statistical trend, can you explain to me? And when you go back on uh, the slide, uh, the scatter slide, the like a correlation, you know, uh, representation. I didn't get the page. I, I don't know which slide you refer to. Is this the last one? Yeah, this my one? question is, uh, I saw on that uh, um, scatter presentation a good fit, but at the same time we had some outlier point. Uh, to, uh, oh, the oh, okay, line. the degree distribution. I yeah, think those are the point I mentioned. Uh, well, you know, this is when you navigate the real world, there, are n there is never a perfect fit, right? So, for example, this is, this is a, a quite a good fit. Uh, did, did pass the, the test for being a, the exact distribution? It didn't pass it. Uh, but it is a pretty damn good fit <laughs> for the distribution. So nature is never a very specific distribution, but the fact that you can fit most or, or find the same frequency through a mathematical expression is somewhat remarkable. Um, and so that, that is what you can see for the impedance, and that is also what you can see for the nodal degree. Now, actually, I had a comment about these outliers here uh, because I really think that there is a network reduction. I think that it is not normal to have such high degrees. Uh, and so actually it may be a, even a better fit if I didn't have uh, a, a test case that may be a little bit manipulated in certain parts. Uh, but I had actually the two raw transmission lines. So for this one, I actually think that there is a reason for these outliers. For the other ones, I actually am amazed of the fit. And, and that is the takeaway message, that the trends, the statistical trends for the topology of the grid are spectacular, I would say. <laughs> um, but the rest is not 
quite understood how to deal with the, the other parts, Thank you. the interaction with power flows and load flow, generation and load. You got time? Anna, um, Tom Overby from University of Illinois, very interesting presentation. Um, one, one of the things that excites me about your work is one of the challenges we have in the power area is getting test cases out to the broader community. And some of us study the real grid, like the WCC and the Eastern Interconnect, but we all know that's difficult to do and you can't get results out on large systems because they become proprietary very quickly. Have you looked into using your techniques to generate pseudo systems, like you know, put out you know the uh, a two thousand bus test system? Absolutely. I actually, I have that software now. I mean, this is actually mainly the outcome of this project in terms of deliverables was something that will produce these random topologies. Do you have them with impedances and loads and things like that? Because here at Illinois, so, Prosper was just up talking, we're, we're setting up a repository of systems that are publicly available to people so they can download and use them. And we'd really love to have some larger systems that have no proprietary concerns. Yeah, I mean, the, I have to say that there are, we checked the similarity of our models with respect to several parameters. It is very hard to establish that this graph and this graph with all the electrical characteristics, with all the location of the generators, with all of this detail, they are from the same sample distribution. So as far as the parameters that we mentioned, you know, the degree distribution, where you tend to find generators, where you tend to find loads, the, the wiring and the impedances, these are realistic samples. So, so this is what the, the, the software that we, we generated is. And, and in the end, this is why we, we were interested in seeing how it scaled, because we wanted to generate very big. How big have you gone? Uh, this you can go endlessly. The question is, that because we have at most systems that are 3,000 buses, right? Is it true that if you go at 10,000 or 20,000 buses, is it true that the trend will keep being like this? Um, so that's the only question that, that I have, because I don't have that sample to say, yes, that's how they go. Thanks, Anna. Um, you, know, you know, if I can just make a comment before we close, I mean, I understand what you're saying, that you want, in a certain statistical sense, with certain measures, your 2,000 bus system to rep rep represent the same statistics as some other real 2,000 bus system. Yeah. But I think that, I, I think that, I think that's a good goal, but I think we have to remember, let's, let's just take an IEEE 30 bus system or some one that's already out there. That one doesn't represent, in a statistical sense, all the different 30 bus systems you might find. Well, that's an interesting so, thing. I think the analysis shows that since these seem to have such a regular trend, it probably does, but it's just one sample. Right? That's my point. Yeah. And so you're, I think you're being a little too harsh on yourself. I think the models are useful because they're just one point and they're probably the same in a lot of ways. Anyway, I think we should thank Anna. We're really glad to have her. Those of you will see her in person next week if you come to our workshop. Thank, thank you, you very much, Anna. Thank you.